Ladies and gentlemen, in 1862, Otto von Bismarck became minister president, prime minister, one might say, of Prussia. And within the next few years, Prussia was involved in, in three wars, which I think one must call, although he wasn't solely responsible for them, Bismarck's Wars. The first war, which was a war by Prussia and Austria combined against Denmark over two uh, duchies called Schleswig and Holstein, I will not detain you with. They are of extreme complication in their causes. Lord Palmerston indeed said that there were only three people who could understand the problem of Schleswig and Holstein. One was the Prince Consort who was dead, the second was a German professor who, was, who had gone mad, and the third was Palmerston himself who had forgotten about it so that I think we better leave it forgotten. But in any case, it's a curious beginning, an alliance between Prussia and Austria, an alliance which was soon to be severed by Bismarck's own work. Bismarck's achievement, of course, was to, I was going to say make, wrong word, to unite Germany. In 1862, well, from 1815 onwards, the German states were brought together in a loose confederation, mm, something like the EEC, I should say, both in its complications and in its ineffectiveness. Uh, technically, Austria was the uh, presiding power. Prussia, though a great power, had to play a secondary part. For German liberals and nationalists, this was an exasperating situation. But remember, because this is the key to a great part of the story, the German Confederation had been created by the Congress of Vienna. It was a part of international law. And while it was easy for a revolutionary like Garibaldi in Italy to defy international law and make Italy, it was very different for Bismarck, who was a conservative and the servant, the leading minister, of a very conservative king. Bismarck's achievement was to maintain, in a sense, conservative principles without abandoning the aim of liberal unity. What Bismarck would have liked, I think, was to reach a peaceful agreement with Austria. After all, circumstances had changed, as you know, they often do, despite international law. Circumstances had changed since 1815. In 1815, at the time of the Congress of Vienna, Austria was perhaps a greater power, certainly an empire, whereas Prussia was only a kingdom. By the mid-1860s, Austria had fallen behind. Uh, Prussia had become much the greater power, greater in wealth and greater, of course, in industrial resources. Prussia was a prospering modern kingdom. Austria was a decaying or a stagnant empire. And one might easily say that the wise thing for a stagnant empire is to hitch itself onto some other great power rather than to run into troubles. But it is very difficult when you have been one of the greatest powers in Europe, to renounce some of your grandeur to step down. The Austrian statesman and the Austrian emperor, Franz Josef, were well aware of Austria's problems, conflicts of nationalities, uh, ineffective economic system, and of Austria's weakness in Europe. They had relied on allies, principally on Russia. But Russia had ceased to count in Europe after the Crimean War, and Great Britain, who at one time had called Austria the natural ally, had also lost interest in Europe. Austria was very much on her own, with the exception of France. And here was another problem that Napoleon III, the semi-revolutionary emperor, couldn't make up his mind whether he was on the side of the conservative power or on the side of the liberal and quasi-national power. And one other point that one should bear in mind, Austria depended essentially on her army. In 1848, at the time of the revolutions, it was said by the great Austrian poet Grupatz, who addressing Radetzky, the commander-in-chief in Italy, in deinem Lager ist Österreich, in your military camp lies Austria. And to confess the weakness of the army would be to confess the weakness of the monarchy altogether. From 1864, which was the time of the Danish war, for the next two years, there was a complicated diplomatic maneuvering between Bismarck on the one side and the Austrian statesman on the other. Bismarck gave the impression, at any rate, 
as many people do when they're uh, seeking a gain, that he was the conciliatory one. He offered compromises, he offered to sustain the Austrian Empire elsewhere in Europe if Austria would renounce her claim in, in Germany or renounce her position in Germany. He expressed a solidarity for conservative principles, but at the same time he was always demanding that Austria should concede, that Austria should recognize the equality or even more than the equality, but at any rate, the equality between Prussia and Austria. If not, he threatened, then there would be a liberal revolutionary nationalism in Germany, which would uh, destroy both the conservative Prussian uh, kingdom and the empire of Austria. These negotiations had the strangest twists. At uh, one time, it's a nice 19th century touch, in the middle of 1865, the King of Prussia and his ministers met at a place called Gastein to hold a council of war to decide whether they should go to war with Austria the next week. The delightful thing about it is that Gastein was actually in Austrian territory. Fancy going on holiday to your enemy's territory and discussing whether they should go to war, where you, you, you should go to war with her. But that's how they did things in these more or less civilized times. The situation grew ever tenser, but the problem is, uh, Cavour had it too in Italy, but Bismarck had it much more. How, without infringing international law, can you challenge a system such as the German Confederation set up by international law? The only hope is that the country which benefits from international law, and otherwise Austria, can be herself provoked into war. And Bismarck's persistent offers of peaceful settlement were, I think, intended to push the Austrians into impatience. There was another fascinating thing. It's the first time this happened in regard to the outbreak of a war, that the actual time of mobilization came to count. In other words, that instead of armies acting once war has been declared, it is the movement, or was the movement of armies, which brought the war on. The technical point is this. The Prussian army could mobilize in three weeks. The Austrian army took six weeks. Therefore, unless Austria started to mobilize first, she would be at a disadvantage. But if she mobilized first, she would appear to be the aggressor. So the Austrians tried to turn the trick by offering uh, simultaneous disarmament. The King of Prussia thought he was caught and agreed. Bismarck was, I was going to say, broken-hearted. He'd missed his war. But then the Austrians were afraid of Italy in their rear. If they disarmed, then perhaps Italy would attack them. They considered partial mobilization, a thing which came up again and again later on against Italy. Then said, if we do partial mobilization, we shan't be able to have full mobilization. So they mobilized. And when Bismarck uh, uh, heard this, he exclaimed, God save the king. Because from that moment, William thought that Austria was the aggressor. Even then, though Austria was mobilizing, you see, the Prussians could sit back for a fortnight and let Austria mobilize and thus appear to be the aggressor and still with their three weeks catch up ahead. As a matter of fact, all this business about mobilization race turned out to be un pointless because both sides were fully mobilized when the, the war of 1866 began. In the end, that is to say, the beginning of July 1866, they lost patience. It was the Austrians who took the first step by getting the German Confederation to denounce Prussia. This gave Prussia the opportunity to withdraw from the German Confederation and to declare that the Confederation was at an end. With that, the Prussian armies could perhaps invade other German states, but they had no real conflict with Austria. Uh, indeed, when it came to the point even Bismarck, with all his ingenuity, couldn't think of a reason why they were at war. So the Prussian army advanced through Saxony. When the Prussian armies reached the Austrian frontier, a junior Prussian officer was sent from the commander-in-chief with a letter to find the nearest Austrian officer. He handed him this letter and it said, I beg to inform you that a state of war exists. That's how one of the greatest wars of the century began. No ultimatum, no declaration of war, they just got going. The war produced the desired result, so far as Bismarck was concerned. Austria was 
excluded from Germany, northern Germany was put under Prussian hegemony, and Prussia had become a greater power. But Bismarck himself made a rather different comment, a comment which I think is particularly apposite to all the discussions which go on about war origins, and particularly about the which is the aggressor, which country started. As you know, at, at Nuremberg, it was made a charge that German statesmen had planned for aggressive war. Bismarck, when the king wanted to have revenge on Austria, he said, Austria started the war, therefore Austria should be punished. Bismarck replied, Austria was, in, was no more in the wrong in opposing our claims than we were in making them. That, I think, is all that there is to be said about charges of aggressive war or war guilt. The second of, strictly the third of Bismarck's wars, if we count the Danish war, is a very different matter. The, if ever there were a planned war, a war of purpose, it was Bismarck's war against Austria. That war had fulfilled a program which the liberals had had for many years of virtually uniting Germany. It had fulfilled Bismarck's program because it had united or largely united Germany and established Prussian leadership in Germany without upsetting the conservative order. It had been a war defined in its purpose and limited in its achievement. The moment that Bismarck got what he wanted, he stopped. And although he may have hoped beforehand to get these results without war, possibly by bluff, possibly by negotiation, possibly by conciliation, at any rate, it was quite clear in his mind that something like this was necessary if Germany were to be made into a united national state and if Prussia were to retain her leadership in Germany. Relations between Prussia, or it's, it was now called the North German Federation, and France were of quite a different character. And although Bismarck was to be blamed, censored for this war also, his responsibility uh, was much less. Responsibility at any rate only in the sense, perhaps, that he, he failed to foresee events. After all, Prussia and France had no conflict. France, technically at any rate, did not claim to dominate uh, Europe, let alone Germany. Prussia had no territorial claims on France. These claims, such as they were, sprang out of the subsequent war. They had never been formulated beforehand. Napoleon III, on his side, had claims of a sort against Prussia and Germany. Napoleon III had been Emperor of the French since 1852. He had arrived at this position solely or very largely because he possessed his uncle's name. He had, he was condemned, as one of the great French historians said, his origins condemned him to success. As a Napoleon, he had to succeed. Otherwise, he would be discredited, and people would say, why should we bother to have a Napoleon? We might just as well have a republic. Uh, in a sense, he succeeded in Italy in 1859, when he'd acquired Savoy and Nice. But he needed more success. He had a very enlightened view that France would be a stronger country, and a more, uh, a stronger country in, in Europe generally, if instead of divided countries, there was a national Germany and a national Italy where they could all combine together, he was one of the many who saw a vision of a united Europe, a un Europe which would be bound together on liberal or at any rate national principles. He had welcomed, therefore, the national unification of Italy. He was not opposed to the national unification of Germany. But there the other side of his position came in. If Germany were to be united and stronger, then, according to all the calculations of traditional diplomacy, France would be weaker. And indeed, Thiers, one of the French statesmen, said about the uh, Prussian victory at, at Sadova in Austria in 1866, it is we who were beaten at Sadova. Uh, 
because France had now was not so strong as when Germany was disunited. Therefore, France should receive compensations. And Napoleon III duly made these compensations, I think unwillingly, or at any rate, very hesitatingly, and Bismarck very reasonably refused them. There was no earthly reason why, because Germany had become united, France should be compensated. The discussions tailed away, but leaving resentments on both sides. And at various times, Napoleon tried by means of diplomacy, by threats of alliance, alliance, how paradoxical, with Austria, the country which he turned out of, of Italy in uh, 1859, or even alliances of both Austria and Italy with France to seek revenge, to hold up the advance of German power to undo the unification of, of Germany, which was now underway. None of these things really achieved much success. And the general impression of observers in the years before 1870 is that although Germany was not united yet, because southern Germany had not been brought in, yet Germany was on the move to unification, and that Bismarck would accomplish the miracle of doing it without, not only without international war, which seemed very unlikely, uh, but without social or national upheaval and revolution at home. It was a slow process, and Bismarck was perfectly patient and was prepared to wait. At the same time, he was naturally anxious to increase the prestige of the King of Prussia. If the King of Prussia was to become the head of a united Germany, then he must rank along with the other great powers, perhaps take on an imperial name. And this seems to be the explanation of a very strange story which started the conflict of, of 1870. In 1868, there was a revolution in Spain. Queen Isabella was dissolute. She was, had been married to an impotent husband and uh, took the not uh, surprising way out of having many lovers uh, who rather filled up the royal castle. In time, the expenditure of maintaining these royal lovers exasperated the politicians of Spain, and there was a revolution, and she was dethroned. A Spanish general became temporary regent, and there was a republic. But the Spanish, or well, the Spanish rulers, didn't want to uh, remain Republican. And the throne of Spain was hawked round Europe. A bit dodgy, you see. You couldn't, you suppose at any rate, you couldn't have anybody who was too closely connected with any royal house. Uh, Napoleon ran one of his cousins, but there was a general outcry that this would be putting France in power in Spain. And then Bismarck had what seemed to him at the time, I think, a bright idea. Spain was a Catholic country. There was in the house of Hohenzollern, you know, the kings of, of Prussia were Hohenzollerns, and they had a separate family line who were Catholic Hohenzollerns. Now, here was a young man, Leopold, of Prince, of Ho Prince Hohenzollern, who had all the qualifications. He was a liberal, so that he would uh, cooperate with liberal Germany. He was a good loyal, but not over patriotic German, and he was a Catholic. A beautiful answer, you would think, to the problem. Moreover, his brother was already Prince of Romania and had been nominated to this post by Napoleon III himself. So obviously Napoleon didn't dislike the Catholic Hohenzollerns. Bismarck appreciated that there would be some French protests, and he therefore meant to rush the thing. Now, I should warn you that there have been, well, now over a hundred years of discussion and dispute, and it's often alleged that Bismarck deliberately organized the Hohenzollern candidature in order to provoke France into war. It's also alleged that he did it in order to strengthen the German side against France during the war. I think, I say this with some hesitation, I think that these views are mistaken. Uh, Bismarck certainly said that if there were a Hohenzollern king in Spain, then France would have to keep some army on the Pyrenees, and this would make war less likely, not more so. He never imagined, he was quite right in this, that Spain would go to war on the German side. So I think, if anything, his consideration was simply, this will make France more reluctant 
to, to threaten us. But there again, it doesn't seem as if he was considering mainly this. He was considering, I think, largely the prestige of the Prussian royal house and more practical things, he thought it would be good for trade between Germany and Spain because Bismarck was a very modern, modern man in this way. He thought a lot about economics and he thought the Spaniards would, would be keener on German buying things from German industry than French industry if they had a, a German king. The essential thing was to get Leopold to Spain and on the throne before the French could protest. And it was all tied up. The Spanish representative in Berlin sent a telegram on June 26, 1870, saying, I'll be back in three days with Leopold's consent. The Spanish Parliament, or Cortes, was in session. It would meet on the 29th of June. Leopold would be in. The French would be taken by surprise. And then, this is an unbelievable story, but this is what caused the war. A cipher clerk in the Berlin legation in Madrid read the ciphers wrongly. He reported that the Spaniard coming from Berlin would only arrive on the 9th of July. But this was too long for the parliament. They couldn't be get there during the summer heat, and they went away. By the time Salazar, for that was his name, arrived, Cortes had dispersed. They had to be summoned back. But they had to explain why they were being brought back. They were being brought back to elect a king. And therefore, the news became public before Leopold, in fact, never got to Spain at all. The surprise was never sprung. Instead, the news arrived in Paris. And here was the second decision, I think, which made the war, oh, more than likely, inevitable. The, the Bonapartist dynasty, Napoleon III himself and his family, were losing prestige. Napoleon III was sick, uh, very often ineffective. He was harassed by the demands of liberals to turn uh, the Second Empire into a constitutional monarchy. He had only a young son who was not old enough to succeed him. We know, in fact, that he was a very sick man. He died three years later, and he'd been sick for a long time before that. The tough old guard who'd put him on the throne, the Bonapartist adventurers who'd made a fortune out of the empire and were a set of scamps for the most part, uh, were anxious to restore the prestige of the empire. And how could this be done? Why? By humiliating Prussia. That far from shrinking and saying we're a bit, this is a plot of Bismarck's to catch us in the war, they, if it were a trap, they jumped straight into it. They welcomed it because, for one thing, they got a strong case, they could protest. If the French government, if Napoleon III had wanted merely to stop the candidature of, of Leopold, they could have protested at Madrid and it would have been dropped. But from this there would be no prestige. Therefore they must press, protest in Germany, protest to King William. The protest was made, the great delight of Napoleon III and his advisers. And William III, who disliked the idea of Leopold going to Spain all along, agreed at once to drop him. The reason I may explain why William wanted Leopold not to go is not at all because he was worried about France. He thought Leopold might get killed, or that in any case the job of being king of Spain was not an attractive one for a cousin of his. So he welcomed the idea and said, oh, yes, I never really liked it. I'll be, have a word with the boy and, and he'll withdraw. This was no good for the uh, French government, for the French ministers. Not humiliating enough. Prussia had been conciliatory, friendly. So they drafted another note. William must apologize, although he never had anything to do with the cantature. Not only must he apologize, he must promise that Leopold never tried to run as candidate again. He must give guarantees that no such things would ever happen. This was the moment of decision. Bismarck, very curiously, I think because he'd no idea there was going to be that the war would blow up as it did. He was taken as much by surprise as anyone else. Bismarck had been far away in the country. When the first French demand was made, he felt this was very humiliating. 
but he was rather relieved because Bismarck was a great one for putting the blame on others. He never tried to cover up even for the king. He was rather re relieved because the humiliation had fallen on William, not on himself. Just at the time when the second French demand was underway, he came back to Berlin. In one way he was depressed. They'd missed their chance. Prussia could have asserted herself by answering sternly. The king had let them down. And we have a description of Bismarck having uh, supper with Moltke, chief of the general staff, both of them very gloomy and speaking very unfavorably about William, how feeble he'd been just because of the threat of war or just worrying over Leopold, he'd back down. And then there came the second message from William describing the meeting where he'd been ordered to, uh, to apologize. And he said, though in a, a very... Uh, gentle way, I told the French ambassador I had nothing more to say to him. Leopold has withdrawn, I have nothing more to say. Bismarck said, that's it. And he seized the pencil and he changed every word which he put in, it's called the Ems telegram because uh, William sent it from uh, Ems. Every word he put in the telegram was correct, but it was arranged in such a way that instead of the king saying, well, Leopold's withdrawn, there's nothing more I need say, to the king saying, I have nothing to say to you. Published the same day. And with this, the French press was in an uproar. The streets of Paris were crowded uh, with, the, with the cry of, to Berlin, and without almost any consideration, Napoleon III prepared to go to war. An extraordinary thing about this, one extraordinary thing, is the total lack of consideration displayed by the uh, French, by the ministers, by Napoleon, as to the possibilities of going to war. Uh, it seems very late in the day that men, when they're moving on the edge of war, that they look at it and say, well, can we win? Is there any sense in it? As a matter of fact, the French army was in a very bad state. Napoleon III, who had certain training as an artillery officer and abilities in other way, was aware of this and a reform of the French army had begun. This reform was still dragging behind. People earlier had despised the Prussian army. Its victory in 1866 showed that it was the first in Europe. But when it came to the point, Napoleon and the Council of Ministers relied solely on their prestige, the prestige of the great name of Napoleon I. And thus, for a cause which they themselves had trumped up, they launched a great war when France suffered defeat after defeat, and at the end blamed Bismarck for it. As for Bismarck, he drew a striking moral from having laid on three wars. It was to have no more wars.